Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Rob Simons and I'm the board president of the Downtown Chamber Series. And I am joined today by the one and only Stephen Meckel. Welcome, Stephen. <laughs> Happy to be here. Good to see you again. Good to see and you I'm too. Ahead. We're very excited to have you back. So first of all, let's jump into your program. You're gonna be coming down on April 20th, 21st and 22nd to play three shows at First Studio with a really interesting program at Beethoven, Poulenc and Sanson. Tell us about how you chose that program. Well, um, I, I, you know, it, I kind of go back and forth. I was, I'm very interested in the French Romantic repertoire. I think it's very fun. It's very flashy. I, I enjoy making a show. So, you know, the Saisons was an easy go to. And I thought that would be a really fun piece to end a recital with and to kind of come back to the valley because I haven't done much playing in Phoenix since I left. Um, and Beethoven for me is a staple. And I and I it's sort of a nod not only to um, my dear friend Paula Fan, who was my pianist for 20 years, who passed away last year and and if you remember we did the full Beethoven cycle with the downtown chamber series the last time I was I played on your series mm -hmm. and I, I I just thought you know what I really do want to kind of kind of bring that back and it's frankly it's just a great recital opener mm -hmm. <laughs> and I like a, I like a piece to kind of get my nerves out and uh, just kind of get get going in something that I'm very comfortable with and the Poulenc which is very interesting is my, it will be my first time playing it so this will be I'm really thrilled that I get a, a, a three night run mm -hmm. with with this piece because it's a really quirky sonata and I've never heard of it. Um, I came to it because uh, the pianist that I'm working with, uh, Nathan Arch, he did a bunch of his doctoral recitals on the chamber music of Poulenc and, the, and his and Poulenc's one woman opera. And he was like, oh, we should read the sonata sometime. I was like, I sure. And I just sort of was like, well, and, and you know, I appealed to me and I thought, you know what, this is a good chance to learn something new. So that's how the program came to be, and I hope you really enjoyed it. We'll be we'll be talking a little bit about the Poulenc in the, during the recital because Poulenc is such an interesting composer and very different than, frankly, than any other sonata that I've played. I mean, it's a little bit more. It, it reminds me a little bit, so uh, you know, like of of you know these 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 sort of like Shumanovsky myths or these these pieces that or Enescu sonatas that are very um, sort of not fractured, but very kind of interestingly like pieced together. Mm -hmm. And it's and it's something that that it cha he changes his mood really fast. He changes his ideas really fast. So I'm really excited to play it. And I hope I hope people really gravitate towards it. It should be fun. We'll go back to the Beethoven for a minute. I remember playing this piece in uh, in grad school and recitals and stuff. And it is uh, the Beethoven sonata repertoire spans his his lifetime. And so maybe you could say a little bit about where the how you approach the first sonata as a violinist stylistically and where does it fall in with his uh with, with his output beethoven's output that is yeah i have two different approaches to this sonata uh, uh, one is if i play the whole cycle mm -hmm. and two if i play it as a first piece um i find beethoven incredibly romantic and i enjoy exploring the romanticism of beethoven even at his early age i would say uh, in in the early stages of his composing, which this sonata falls into, he, he's it, it sounds very much like Haydn. It's dedicated to Salieri. It's very much in this classical vein of 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 structure and and poise and everything's there. It's just it's perfect. It's got a variation middle movement. It's got a rondo finale. You couldn't ask for a more classical piece. And when I play the whole cycle, the way I pair this sonata is I pair it with in the first half of the recital with the final sonata so i play this one very very classically mm -hmm. in order to give a very strong difference when i play it by itself i i embrace sort of the knowledge of a later beethoven which was like you know he was sort of the first one to start writing fortissimos into chamber music you don't see a lot of that in mozart um mm -hmm. mozart symphonies like this idea of sforzati and fortissimos that beethoven was so adamant about and the subito piano and this kind of like edginess that even in his early works start coming in i would say it's a lot more prominent as you get towards like sonata number four through seven and then of course you've got kreutzer which of course is a completely different ball game but so so i do like so you'll hear me be i i do like to keep it very honest of course i studied in salzburg so my teacher would roll over in his grave if i didn't but but i do like to see this i do like to um explore a little bit of beethoven's journey already in this first sonata i love that idea that that the context matters in terms of the performance and how you approach the piece and you have like two different pitches to throw here um i want to talk about the context of your career though too because obviously our audience is very familiar with you 
Um, and maybe some people forget, myself included, that you started in Arizona as a concertmaster as you're when you're 19 years old. And so you're you're in a different context of your career now as a performer, exploring new types of repertoire, and as a teacher. Tell us about your your the holistic musical life of Stephen Meckel as it exists now. Oh my gosh, <laughs> as it exists now. Yeah, it exists now. Figuring it out. I mean, it's it's a journey, you know. I mean, I was for so many years. I mean, I, um, just a quick correction. I was 19 when I first won my job in Germany. Um, as concertmaster yeah, opera. When I came to Tucson mm. in 2002, um, I guess I would have been 24 at the time. That's when I started in Arizona. So I've been I'm I I've been in Arizona. What year do we have? I don't know. 2000, <laughs> almost 25 years. Um, and I I was in Tucson for eight seasons, and then I was 13 seasons. I was concertmaster in the Phoenix Symphony. So I really when I when I when I when I decided to apply and to kind of move into teaching at that point I'd been really concertmaster for 25 years and there's an interesting aspect of that that sort of happens when you're kind of part of an organization like that it's very much an identity mm -hmm. it's very much um, it's very much what you do and I I I I was finding myself wanting to explore a little bit more um, a little bit more chamber music a little bit less um, I don't know, sort of the grind of of what an orchestra represents. And, you know, so I just sort of, I, it, you know, I had always thought that I was going to kind of transition into teaching. I I had not, did not think that I was going to kind of transition so severely out of the concertmaster business, um, but it just, that's just the way it happened. And so I do occasional things, um, but I'm just kind of letting myself expand into into doing some neat projects that I've always wanted to do that weren't really possible with an orchestra or that are possible at a school um, where you've got colleagues, um, you know, that'll, 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 that'll work with you in, in some of your ideas. And so that's kind of where I'm at right now. So for a lot of musicians, myself included, uh, the the pandemic kind of forced a reevaluation of your musical life and your career. And I wonder what you, what have that you brought to your students? In other words, how do you think teaching up and coming musicians after this massive disruption and shock in all of our lives, uh, how is teaching different now than it might have been before all this happened? Well, I think there was a, there was sort of a, um, you know, there there was this sort of like flailing, mm -hmm. you know, certainly from me, I I was quite depressed. I didn't want to play. Um, the violin for a while. I wanted to do something completely different. I just was kind of very disillusioned and I felt very abandoned by my profession, keeping in mind that we're talking about performance. Mm -hmm. We're not talking about arts or music in general, where in fact, there was this, if you will, during COVID, when we were on lockdowns, when we were so isolated from one another, our, our main we sought out art more than ever before, whether that's music or television or puzzles or whatever. I, you know, and I think that I think that overall, the what's the idea of people now wanting to go into music is just different. There, the the it's more of a of a of this idea of like, wow, I I don't like what I'm seeing. I don't feel drawn to a profession uh, for whatever reasons, whether that's just the way the world seems to be or like this idea that you know what we can we can be at home i it was i'm glad to have my parents around or i'm glad to have family this kind of idea and and that music can now be a part of people's lives it's very interesting that it's not this like oh you have to go <clears throat> you have to go to juilliard and and win a job in in the cleveland orchestra in order to be successful in music so that kind of idea that was sort of like um ingrained in me of like drive 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 and you know do your thing really is just simply different now and it's really interesting to see these kids i i think I'm, I'm right now i'm graduating the senior class that had their first year of college in lockdown online and so i am seeing you know i'm so i'm i'm, I'm actually curious about how this this transition and in fact this year is a very interesting year in terms of people coming into music because it's the senior class that was a freshman in high school mm -hmm. where a lot of ensembles and where a lot of uh, the music making was lost to the kids mm -hmm. and i'm seeing a direct correlation to that now too with not just interest but just ability and kind of idea of of what they may want to do so i'm I, i'm really curious as how it will go how it will continue so i'm yeah here even at the even at dcs you know all of the conversations of the board and with mark dix obviously is about what is this piece of stability this this, in, this little institution that's been around for a quarter century 
how how does it provide some stability in that what came before will stay the same, but how also do you find passages for innovation? And what I think is interesting, you know, as we receive more support from the city, the city of Phoenix, that is, um, this need to integrate arts into more parts of life and to be less myopic and to have a, a broader view. So I think it's really interesting that you brought this this sense of exploration after this horrible time, and but you're seeing that carry on with your own students. Oh, a hundred percent. And I'm seeing it just a completely, and of course I'm up here at NAU, right? I mean, again, we're not churning out New York Phil violinists. We're turning out people that are very interesting and very, they want art to be a part of their life. They want it to be part of their, whatever they go into their, whether it's psychology or whether it's, you know, all of these different things and music and art is gonna be, have a completely different role going forward. And the, the idea is to create these people who are constantly staying open to to whatever whatever comes their way and i think arts specifically is in, in incredibly valuable in that process and i think that's why you know, why this this profession and why why we teach and why why it needs to continue whether or not we say like oh sure you're going to get a job no that's not the point anymore mm -hmm. i think that's what people are seeing in fact in all professions no one's going into a profession with 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 this idea of like oh that's going to make me so and so much money i think people are are coming out of COVID saying like what makes me happy what is my passion and so we're seeing kind of a diverse student body that's that's quite intriguing as a as a teacher as a new teacher too because it's like well the things that i was taught don't necessarily work anymore and mm -hmm. so i'm constantly like adjusting and trying to find my own my own style of of continuing this legacy if you will and it's such a great thing that, I mean, the, the best teaching really is a bridge between generations, like all this accumulated experience of your of your teachers, your your work experience and how that carries on into what you bring to audiences, but also to your students. And I think it's a, it's a, it's a beautiful place to wrap up, Stephen. I just want to say you've always wanted violence. I've always looked up to for years and years, got the, a few years to be your colleague, but uh, you bring such vitality and expression to your playing. We're excited to have you back at some of your first concerts since leaving um, the Phoenix Symphony back Back here in Phoenix and to make art a part of the lives of people living in downtown Phoenix yeah. in this audience. So make people's lives people. better. <laughs> so art makes things better. better. And so we'll be looking for you again April 20th, 21st, and 22nd at First Studio in downtown Phoenix. The the links to the concerts will be in the description. And thank you again, Stephen, for making time for us. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me.